Yeah, so my name is Matt. Uh, like Bruce said, I'm working with him right now, um, doing deep learning on audio stuff. Uh, so this is, I actually hadn't looked at images from deep learning in a while, so I, I felt a little stale on it uh, when we started putting this presentation together. Um, so we kind of put it together, uh, put this presentation together together, and uh, so if anything goes wrong, it's his fault, not mine. You take a couple of steps that way. I think we'll this way. Feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Where's? You're going to get better. It's well. There's kind of speakers everywhere. But yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. So the overview of the competition. Um, so the competition. It. Uh, it's basically a. Uh, it's trying to do image recognition and segmentation for autonomous driving. And it's, it was put on in conjunction with this workshop on autonomous driving. So it was kind of a conference that went along with it. And um, they, all the winners were invited to actually present and speak at the conference. Um, but looking at the numbers here, so had uh, 141 teams with 197 participants in total. Matt, I'm going to get you to move that mic down. I don't know why you're going to keep that tonight. We don't usually. That yeah. Might be okay. Uh, still there. Um, $2,500 in prize money total. Um, and as I said, associated with this CVPR workshop. Um, and the whole data set was provided by Baidu, which is a Chinese company who's doing research and looking into um, self-driving cars themselves. So it's actually a pretty small number of teams for these competitions. Um, so one of the, probably the big problem, there, there were two main problems that kept the numbers so low. First one is that there's 92, 92 gigabytes of, of data to go through. Um, so it's pretty tough to actually be competitive without some pretty expensive hardware. Um, and the, the images you were provided are actually approximately 4K. They're, they're 140 times bigger than a 256 by 256. So fitting one, like a batch size of one on a GPU is, is tough. Um, and then the second problem is Kega wasn't actually providing um, points for the competition. Um, so unless you could get into the prize money, it wasn't really worth anything after that. Uh, so that kind of resulted in the numbers being low. Um, but it was still a great competition. I guess you'll have to stand right behind the thing, sorry. Yeah. So great competition. Um, lots of interesting stuff happened there. So I'll give a brief overview of exactly what you were trying to do in the competition here. So every year there's a, um, a competition called ImageNet. And the most famous component of it is um, just doing the image classification. So you're given an image, and it's actually typically a single category, and you try to predict what's in that. Um, now that's kind of more or less solved in a way. Uh, that problem that hasn't been a very difficult problem for a few years. Uh, so there's other components of that competition, um, mainly this object localization where instead of simply saying what's in the image, you actually have to put a bounding box around and show exactly where it is in the image. Now, kind of in parallel to that, um, some pretty interesting work a few years ago has come out in this semantic segmentation, um, which is pretty amazing. And so you're doing a per pixel labeling of what's in the image. Um, so here we've got all the, the sheep are blue, the dog is red, and the humans in teal here, um, and presumably grass for the background. Um, but this, this competition actually goes a little bit further. And you even have to separate out um, the different instances from each other. So one sheep is not the same as another sheep. Um, and, then, and then actually create a mask for each individual instance. Uh, so here's a, a short overview of what, what the training data actually looked like. So you were given images from a self-driving car. 
Um, and then for seven different categories, you had to create a mask for all objects present. So we can see um, there's a, a truck and a few cars in that overlay. Um, we've got a, I think that's a person on a motorbike right there. So basically the, the point of the competition is to take these images from the self-driving car and label everything in the image, put masks over top of it and where, where they actually lie. Um, so the, for the data, um, so you were given the 92 gigabytes of, of data to train and test on. Um, and then a separate PNG file, which actually contained the ground truth labeling. Um, so basically you had both the class and the instance number for each object present in the image. Um, so for example, this pixel value, if you had pixel value 33,000 on the image, that corresponds to category number 33 and instance zero. Or the 36010 is category 36, which is a person, and the 11th instance of the person in the image. Um, and now, this didn't really come up too much. Yep, how, Mike. How do they number the instances? Uh, so for example, there were the five sheep that were on the photo. Which one was sheep zero, which one was sheep one, et cetera? Um, so it doesn't really matter. The, the evaluation metric is permutation invariant. Um, yeah, and then so it didn't come up in the competition really, but the, the data was actually taken from um, short video clips and sliced into indiv individual frames. Now, somebody did actually write a kernel uh, that figured out, because uh, the, the frame information is actually encoded in the file name, they were actually able to recreate short, short videos from the training data. But as far as I can tell, nobody actually used that in the competition itself. So I'm going to kind of give you all a spoiler here. Um, mass, uh, an algorithm called MaskRCNN dominated the competition. Um, I'm going to go cover what that means and what that, um, what that algorithm consists of in a few minutes. But I, so when I originally saw the competition, I assumed that a an algorithm called the UNet was going to dominate. And it, it took a while before I clued into why the UNet's a problem. Um, so UNet does what's called semantic segmentation. So like we've got in this image, UNet will give you this. Um, but we, we want this instant segmentation here. Um, so the problem with that is, um, you're, you're scored on each individual instance of an object that you can find. So in the, in the example that I have down here, the UNet can provide this mask right here, showing what's a chair, what's not a chair. Um, and you could even apply a boundary segmentation, split it up into individual items like this, but it still won't realize that there's four chairs here and four chairs, three or four chairs here. It's just going to consider this one. Um, so the, the, RCN, the mask RCNN is an algorithm that provides both bounding boxes for each instance of an object and additionally the mask um, for which pixels correspond to that image. Um, and then in addition to the mask RCNN unit, um, if anyone's familiar with um, SSD or YOLO, there, there are other instant segmentation algorithms. As far as I can tell, they're much faster than mask RCNN, simpler architecture, but they don't perform as well. Um, so almost everybody high up in the leaderboard used mask RCNN here. Um, oh, and one other advantage is that pre-trained models on uh, a Microsoft data set that have the instance segmentation applied are available. Um, so 
often in computer vision, you want to actually take weights from a different model and apply them to your new model. It makes it much easier to train the model. So that's available with the mask RCNN, but not with UNET. Um, so here's uh, just one image that was provided by the competition. Um, they're showing a few more categories than are necessary here, but um, for example, you've got tons of cars clustered here. The UNET would just call them all one car, whereas Mask RCNN is capable of picking each of the cars out in that line. Um, well, actually, go ahead. This, this is a video of uh, one of the competitors put together. Um, so they're showing, they're not actually showing the masks they created, but they're showing the algorithm putting a bounding box on every, every object it finds. So it, it's pretty impressive how it's able to find each individual and find the boundary of each individual car. Um, there's a few challenges that we had in the data, as usual. Um, some basic ones, so there's um, quite um, big lighting variations, big contrast issues within the images. Um, often vehicles or other categories are occluded by others, so you'll have a car that's sitting behind a bus and you have to correctly segment both of them out. Um, or we've got just stacks of bikes here. Um, that we want to try to individually label. Uh, so it's a little bit, little bit ambiguous what each individual bike is even looking at um, these images visually. Um, and another problem, uh, there is um, kind of mediocre labeling in the ground truth. So for example, in this image, they've got one bicycle outlined here, but they're missing all of those and pedestrians on bikes in the middle of the road, which I think is a pretty important data point to find there. Um, and going here, we see a few cars that weren't labeled. Um, this one bike has the triangle filled in, this one doesn't. Stuff missing all over the place. Uh, plus a very poor contrast in this image. Um, and then th this is a slide from the winning solution that I'll cover at the end. Um, but they, they figured that the biggest problem was actually all the small objects. Um, so it, it might be hard to tell from here, um, but for example, in the trees here, they zoomed it up. There's a car that you can see peeking out between the trees. So you've got to pick that out. And um, there's cars way ahead of the road here. Those are all individual instances that you're supposed to pick out in the competition. Um, and so this, this graph that they put into their presentation here, I, I'm not entirely sure. I believe that means that 60% of the, in, of the objects in the training data are less than a 32 pixel square inside a 4K image. Uh, so that, it's pretty tough to pick those out of such a large image. Um, so here is, here's the leaderboard at the end. Um, so there's one by this team in Meg called MegV, uh, by actually a pretty significant margin. Uh, often in these competitions, the, the top 10 in the leaderboard are all just crammed right together, separated by a very small amount. Uh, but in this case, like we've got 0.34 for first, 0.30 second, 0.25 for third. Um, so it's possible that, it, um, that it's just due to the low numbers in the competition. Uh, but, but all the three teams at the top actually did some interesting stuff that may have really helped their scores. Um, so here we have the evaluation metric. Um, it's, it's, a, it's quite a bear of a metric. Uh, it took some time to try to sort it out. I'm still not confident I really understand it. Um, but we've got a few things going on at the same time. 
So we want to know if an instance is correctly classified. So part of your prediction when you're predicting this car is how confident you think it's a car. Um, and, and you do that for each object in the image. Then you're also scored on how good the mask of that car is. Um, and so they, they provided a, an implementation of the, of the evaluation metric in C-sharp, but it's over a thousand lines of code. Um, I, I believe what happened is they took the evaluation metric from Microsoft's Cocoa dataset, um, which works great, but it's pretty hard to figure out what's going on there. But it, it essentially boils down to what's called intersect over union, um, which as this, this diagram shows, it's basically the overlap over the area of both your mask and the ground truth. Yeah. So uh, I have a question. Uh, the mask RNA, is it only rectangular, was it called, regions? Or does it do circular regions to different kind of shapes? So the, the mask RCNN, um, oh, I suppose nothing really shows it yet. It essentially does this object localization and the instant segmentation at the same time. So it gives you a rectangular bounding box, but also the mask um, as well. Uh, so we'll, I'll cover that in a few minutes. Um, yeah, so it's basically an intersect over union. Um, it's bounded between 0 and 1. So the scores of 0.25 to 0.33 don't actually sound good depending on that, but I, I think everything else involved in the um, evaluation metric kind of change it. So, um, so we've also got this precision and recall in the image, what's the precision recall for the, the instance confidence? Um, the IOU. <laughs> Bruce did more research on this part, so he's gonna. I did more research on it, but I won't claim I understand it super <laughs> well. Yeah, this, this slide is showing that the the IOU, the uh, intersection over union, is an input to this precision recall curve, which Matt's going to explain to us in a minute. And then they fiddle the curve a little bit, but then I, I think they're looking at the area under the curve as the final number that they get. So yeah. if, that, if that makes sense. The intersection over union is, is determined whether you've got a, a true positive or a false positive, basically. But then the metric for the competition is this area under the precision recall curve. Yeah. So Maybe by somebody in the room understands it better than we do and can explain it to us. <laughs> yeah. So similar to an AUC curve, if anyone's familiar with those, what you did is kind of iterate through the confidences for each each of the um, instance predictions that you got. Um, so everywhere from a 0 0.50 confidence up to 0 0.95. And then you, using those, you build up this precision recall curve. So, so at each threshold you're looking at, you calculate um, the precision recall for that. Then you interpolate as this red line is showing, and calculate the area beneath that. And that's your final, the final score. Uh, okay, I, I can't see the inputs of the IOU into this, into this um, precision recall. It's like you said you had an input of the um, IOU. Yeah. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, actually, one more. So these uh, threshold values, 0 0.5, 0 0.55, and so on. So there's a series of, of, of 10 of those. 
so for each of those threshold values, if your IOU score is greater than that value, then that's considered a match, which might be a, a true match or a false match, if, depending if you've got the classification category correct. So for each of those 10 threshold values, you're gonna get a different point in the precision recall curve. Here we're just showing four points, but there would be 10 uh, for the full set of threshold values. So you set, so you calculate the IOU for all the predictions. I think you just do that once. Then you, then for each of these threshold values, you, you either throw out the prediction, like if it's below the threshold or you, you keep it. And um, if you keep it, then you check whether it's got the right classification or not. So it's either a true positive or a false positive at that point. And that's the precision recall is basically defined in terms of true and false positives. Uh, and that gives you a point. So each threshold gives you one point in this curve. Make any sense? So now we're going to take a closer look at MASCAR CNN, uh, which is the, the computer vision algorithm that um, won this competition for the most part. Um, so this is just a funny little picture. It doesn't really show a whole lot other than that MASCAR CNN is kind of the state of the art right now. Um, so it, it stands in the lineage of this RCNN and fast RCNN, which I'm going to cover and build up to the MASCAR CNN. Um, and then we've got YOLO and SSD further down here. So uh, this, this photo is by Russ Gershik, who is one of the authors of the MASCAR CNN paper. So that's probably why he put his at the top and SSD and YOLO behind. Um, so this is just kind of a reminder of the different, different tasks we can look at. Um, so the first one is simply the semantic segmentation, trying to categorize every pixel in the image, forgetting about the objects in a way. Um, then you can assume there's a single object in the image and provide a bounding box for that, or assume that there's multiple, or create masks for each individual, individual object in the image. Um, so these are just a few example outputs, actually, of the MASCAR CNN, where it creates that uh, rectangular bounding box, but also does the per pixel segmentation. Um, so the first thing that we we can look at is is running a fully convolutional neural network, but concatenated onto the output of it instead of simply predicting what's in the image, you can actually um, do, a, do a regression on the coordinates of the four corners of the bounding box. Um, so it's a great first attempt at it, uh, but it really struggles with multiple, Im multiple objects in the image because you need a defined vector length for how many different objects you're looking for. Um, so that, uh, that didn't go too far. Um, and now, uh, kind of the simplest thing to think about when doing this is simply taking a sliding window, slide it over the whole image um, like a fixed aspect ratio, and try to predict what's in that image. And if you get high confidence on a particular object in the image, you can kind of call that the bounding box for that image. Um, now, the very traditional machine learning algorithms, <clears throat> like a um, HAR cascade or, or HOG classifier, essentially work this way, where they have specified aspect ratio boxes, they scan over the image. But they actually, they're very computationally cheap to do, so you're able to do that. Um, the problem with a, a big neural network like this is maybe it'll take you a couple hundred milliseconds every time you do one of those classifications. So if you imagine, you could basically have n squared pixels or n squared different boxes you're sliding over here. The, the computational requirements just explode. 
Um, so that's it's pretty unfeasible to, to do in reality. Um, so then in 2014, um, this, this first paper came out. Um, I believe it's out of Microsoft, the, the original RCNN paper. So what they did, they built on the lineage of some of the classical computer vision techniques and actually used a region proposal uh, based on essentially finding blobs in an image. If a certain area looked interesting, then they just tried, they put a box around that and they try classifying what's inside of that. Um, so this is an example of a, a handful of different proposed regions that it's looking at. Um, so creating the regions is pretty easy. Uh, it doesn't take too long. Uh, they're seeing uh, a few seconds on a CPU here. Um, and then, then here's how you actually run those regions through. So, um, so each one of these green boxes here is like one of the green squares in this image. So they take that proposed region out, they reshape it to a square, um, the standard input size of the convolutional neural net. They run it through and they get two outputs. They have an SVM to classify what is in that region. And then um, they also do a bounding box regression to try to, um, try to adjust the bounding box to fit the object better. Yeah, I have a question about uh, how you define interestingness of, of the blobs. Is it gradient uh, change or what's the measure of interestingness? I, I don't know. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the details of that either. And really, this is just a step along the way. So the, we're talking about the evolution of how did we get to the mass RCNN algorithm. Uh, in the early days, this is what they did, and they used these traditional image processing techniques to identify these blobs of interest. As we'll see in a slide or two, that gets replaced by the network learning to find the regions of interest itself. So exactly where these come from doesn't matter too much because we don't do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, while I've got the mic, I'll just comment. You can see from the banner at the bottom of these slides, uh, mm -hmm. we just we I stole them from the uh, CS 231N course uh, from Stanford, which is online. Uh, and if you do want to revisit this and understand a little better, it's just an excellent uh, description that they give uh, in that in that lecture, lecture eleven. Yeah. Um, and so there, there's a few problems with this. Um, actually, actually, going back to your question, the uh, those regions of interest. Basically, you just import OpenCV, and yeah. there there will be a built-in package for that. That's got like three hundred papers worth of different things implemented. Um, so a few problems with this. Um, it's still quite computationally expensive because what we're doing is we're taking, um, let's say we take a thousand different proposed regions. We have to run each one of those individually through this neural network. Um, so if we assume again, it's 200 milliseconds every time you do that, 200 milliseconds times a thousand regions is whatever a um, few minutes to do a single single image, and you're also you're doing a little bit of regression on the bounding box, um, but it can't actually see outside of the proposed region, so you don't know that. It, yeah, it, it it won't work all that well in actually getting the true boundaries of the of the object, given that it can't necessarily see the whole object when it's running. Um, so here, what the next paper, this came out in 2015. Um, so this is called Fast RCNN. So the big thing that they did is you run the image through, through the convolutional neural network once. So that's about 200 milliseconds to run through there. Um, and then we actually create these region of interest um, areas from the output of the convolutions. 
so essentially, the feature map, it, I think it's about halfway through like a VGG16 network, because um, that's what we were working with back in these days. You try to find the regions of interest um, on that feature map. Um, now, that's actually being learned and trained as you're training the network. Um, so you save a lot of computation time. Um, and then we also went to like a linear regression instead of an SVM on the top of the network um, for the, the object classification. Um, so this, this brought the, the computation time way down because you got rid of all this redundant, um, the redundant convolutions running through the image, which were quite expensive. Um, you still have to do it a lot kind of through the second half of the network, but you're working with a much lower resolution image, and um, so that sped up a f quite a bit. Um, so that brought us from a few minutes per image to maybe five seconds per image. Um, then the next, the next paper um, also came out in 2015, so they iterated quite quickly through these. It's called Faster RCNN. Um, so now instead of actually doing this blob detection on the feature map halfway through the convolutional network, we've actually started teaching or having the the neural network itself learn the bounding box proposed regions. Um, so we were, it saves a lot of computation time because we're able to do the whole image through once. Um, and then I, I believe you essentially get the, um, the, the output activations and put them directly into the classification from the bounding boxes themselves instead of having to go through and run another network on top of them. Um, and then the most recent paper uh, came out in 2017. So the first three papers came out in 14 and 15. Then it was a two year gap until they came out with this. Um, what they were able to do here is attach a another convolutional network kind of on the side um, of the original faster RCNN and actually do the per pixel segmentation with that. Um, so you're, you're still running regression on the box coordinates um, and then convolving to get the per pixel classifications. Um, and the, yeah, so we got down to um, about five frames per second, so 200 milliseconds to run this faster RCNN. Um, and mask RCNN is a little slower because we're adding this, this mask, um, the mask network on top of it, uh, but it's still, it's still in the order of a few, couple hundred milliseconds per image. Um, so quite significantly faster than than the previous iterations. Um, so I'll take a look at a few of the solutions now. Um, so this second place, um, they took this, so Baidu provided the full data set for the competition. Um, but what they provided in the competition wasn't actually the entire data set. Um, so this team actually was able to grab the whole data set, go from about 60,000 images to 140,000. So now they're working with about 200 gigabytes of data. Plus they grabbed another data set called Cityscape, which um, this is a sample image from down here. Um, and that gave them another 5,000 images. Um, but they had a pretty interesting insight that really helped them out here. So they found that 99.7% of the objects are located in about a 720 pixel band um, through the middle of the image. So this is a, a 2D histogram or heat map 
of where the objects occur through the whole data set. So essentially what they've done is they got rid of everything above 2,500 and everything below, or 23, and everything below 1,500. So they're training and running inference only on this narrow band in the middle of the image. Um, so the computational costs that they were able to save by running this smaller image totally offset the fact that they're only missing 0.3% of, of the objects. Um, so they, they use mask RCNN. Um, now there's a, a library provided by Facebook's AI research called the Tektron. Um, so it's written in CAFE2, and it's basically a, like a good library for running research in object detection. Uh, they provide a handful of different models, um, like a different core models to work with and different algorithms on top of them, uh, making it quite easy to mix and match and iterate quickly trying out different things. Um, so like I said, they cropped the image down to um, only a 720 pixel band. Um, they used the feature pyramid networks which are part of the MASCAR CNN um, and, and used a ResNet. Um, I think that's actually supposed to be ResNext 101, um, which is another face, or sorry, Microsoft um, neural network architecture. Um, batch size, they can only fit one image at a time on the GPU um, due to running such a big network with such large images. And they use the pre-trained weights from that Coco data set. Um, I just yep. say, I, I guess, I mean, I find that curious that you would choose to run a batch size of one rather than like break your images up into pieces. You know, I mean. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, it adds some complexity, but you know, anyways, I'm just like, that just surprises my in instincts. Yeah. The other thing that the fast AI crowd has found is that you can start your training with low res images and gradually increase the hmm. resolution. So you so you cut them down to two fifty six by two fifty six and do one shot, and then do five twelve by five twelve and do another pass. Okay. Um, and next time this comes up, I bet we'll see that. We didn't really talk about what FPN is, but essentially it is sort of a course to fine strategy like that, where you do uh, the region proposals at, at a low resolution and then extend them to higher resolution. So it's a little bit of what you're talking about already going on behind the scenes here. What Dr. described is on the curriculum learning, actually. So there's a few around machine learning surrounding that kind of building things like lower resolutions and learning from light concept to heavy concept. It's called curriculum learning, actually. Okay, cool. Um, so just take a quick look at this uh, Detectron. Um, so I didn't actually realize this until just now, but um, PyTorch and Cafe 2 are actually merging. Um, they're releasing PyTorch 1.0 quite soon for anybody who's interested in that. Um, so basically what's happening with the PyTorch Cafe merger is PyTorch is actually getting um, static computation graphs, which is funny because PyTorch, the big thing they did was this dynamic computation graph where everything's executed um, essentially where it's defined. Uh, whereas TensorFlow defines a static computation graph and runs it as a single block later on. So TensorFlow has been working quite hard to implement PyTorch's idea, and now PyTorch is starting to work to implement TensorFlow's idea. So we're both going to have both options. Um, so it seems like the idea, between, the idea behind merging Cafe and PyTorch is to take the research benefits from PyTorch, um, 
but add a lot of production tools that are very useful from CAFE too. Because um, as it stands, PyTorch can't really compete with TensorFlow in terms of putting stuff into production. That's where they're struggling. Um, so they're trying to level the playing field by merging with CAFE 2 here. Um, and so this Detectron library that Facebook wrote, um, actually both PyTorch and CAFE 2 are Facebook products right now. Um, so quite natural for them to merge together. Um, so it, this Detectron library gives you, gives you the mask RCNN, fast RCNN, fast RCNN. So that whole lineage, except maybe without our, the original RCN. Um, a few others, uh, Retina Net, um, RFCN that we didn't look at, um, and then the region proposal networks. Um, and then in addition, on the kind of on the back side of each of those algorithms, you need a core um, convolutional neural network. So they make it easy to swap out um, and put in various different types of ResNets, the VGG architecture. Um, so it's probably easy to add stuff here. So if you're looking at doing image detection, um, it wouldn't be a bad idea to take a look at this, this library. Um, so now we'll take a look at the fourth place solution. Um, so they've got the, they ran everything um, all their models they actually, that they trained, they actually used Google Cloud. Um, yeah, so here, Google Cloud is how they trained it. Um, if they, they provided all their code, so if you want to actually run this model, um, even with a GTX 1070, it can be done. Uh, it's gonna take a three to four days, they say. Um, but using, using this data set and all the hyperparameters that they've already set, you'll, you'll have a pretty good model out at the end of it with just a 1070, which is pretty impressive. Um, so they, uh, they didn't do anything too special as far as we can tell. Um, it was the mask RCNN um, written in, in Kyrus and TensorFlow and also a PyTorch. I, I don't know how that worked um, using the two different frameworks. Um, I, think, I think they just had two individual, um, two separate implementations of the same thing to test them out. Um, and then in post-processing, they removed a lot of small objects, apparently with Excel, which makes no sense to me. Um, I mean, I don't see how that's repeatable, and I certainly wouldn't want to go through 10,000 images um, removing stuff. What's RLE stand for? Run length encoding. Yes. Um, so run length encoding is how you actually submit your predictions. Um, it's, it works well for these, um, instead of having to submit an entire image, essentially you say how many pixels in a row are the same value. Um, so for example, if your image is almost all nothing detected, um, then you just have to say like 12,000 zeros in a row. And then once you get into the images, uh, um, maybe I'll say like 10 pixels in this category and then back to the background. Um, so it's just a way that Kaggle is able to deal with the submission files instead of submitting images for all the predictions. Um, and they also ensemble four models together for their solution. Uh, but I, I can't actually think of how you would ensemble in this competition. Um, given how unique the, the ground truth data is, um, it might be ensembling just the instance predictions. You might be ensembling the masks. Uh, but they didn't really go into it very thoroughly. Uh, but they... Apparently, they figured out some way of ensembling. Um, so now, the first place solution is kind of interesting. That they posted a slideshow of their 
essentially of their model, but with no explanation. So there's a lot of acronyms that they don't talk about. Um, now this, this team MEGV, if you look MEGV up, it's, um, it's a Chinese company that does basically facial recognition on a mass scale. And so I looked up uh, the, the guys on the team and they're all, they've all done a lot of research and publications kind of in this area. Um, and, and the fact that they, like they're the object detection team at MEGV. So I have a feeling they have just a beautiful library um, at work, so it was pretty easy for them to um, test things like this out on. Uh, but I'll try to go <laughs> try to go through it. Um, so this is this is kind of a diagram of of the mask or CNN. Um, so this is your um, your convolutional neural network there. It's for example, like the ResNet. Um, I think they used a ResNet 101 in the end. Then. Um, in the middle here is the feature pyramid network um, that, that Bruce mentioned is kind of, it does some of what Ducky was talking about where, where you train on progressively larger images. Um, so if, if we remember at the very beginning, these guys were concerned about how many small objects there were in each of the images. So they were really trying to pick out the very tiny objects um, and then they go to this, um, the, the region proposal network. And I'm, I'm not, so I think, I think one thing that they did here that's non-standard is actually running the region proposal network out of each of the fear, feature pyramid network layers. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually the standard way of doing it. Um, they, they certainly kind of reference doing something interesting with the model, but I, I, I can't really tell what it was. Um, so at the bottom they're showing scores. Uh, I should move ahead. Um, so another, another thing they did is they actually found uh, a vet, what they call the valid training region um, and got a, a reasonable boost by doing this. Um, so here they're showing actually cropping to this small area within the image. Um, what I don't understand is um, if they're doing this dynamically in each image, you know, only bounding on where objects exist, then each image is coming in at a different size. Um, so it's, you can do that with... Um, if your batch size is one, uh, where each image or each batch coming in is actually a different size into the network. Um, but you can't run a batch size greater than one. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know if they had a fixed aspect ratio or fixed size window, or if they were actually doing this dynamically. Um, but they certainly found that um, cropping the image down helped a lot as well. Um, something else pretty interesting that they did is uh, there was a paper in 2016 um, called Sublinear, oh, what's the paper called? Um, Sublinear Memory Requirements for Training. Um, so we, this, running this paper, it, it requires you to actually do two forward passes through the network. Um, but you actually share a lot of the convolution out weight outputs between different convolutional layers. Um, and they managed to actually decrease the, the memory usage of the, of the network by like a factor of four or five times sometimes with the deep networks. Um, so presumably the advantage of this is allows them to run a larger batch size. Um, and when you're... You, you can actually, um, you don't need to be able to fit, for, for the purpose of updating the gradients, or um, updating the weights based on the gradients, you don't actually need to fit 
um, your full update size on the GPU at once. You can actually iterate through, keep summing your gradients, and then do a single gradient update later on, which kind of makes this a little bit redundant since you have to do two passes through. Um, but the one thing that's missing there is actually the batch normalization. You can't iteratively um, update the batch normalization this, in the same way. Um, so in most of these mask or CNN implementations, people actually have stripped the batch normalization out. Um, but presumably, if you've got the sublinear memory plus a GPU with a lot of memory in it, um, you can put batch size or batch normalization back in uh, because you can get the batches large enough to average over a few images. Um, and so here's one of their slides with some acronyms that they don't talk about. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're showing using a f testing with a handful of different models. Um, their final, uh, I think this was their local validation score of, of 33 point, or actually no, that's their final public score of 33.9. So it's using this TIS plus MS. Um, I, I couldn't figure out what those two things are though. Um, but here's just a few samples of the output. Um, we can see the, yeah, so from this little area in the image, they were actually able to mask all those cars out with some pretty impressive precision. Um, and also two different pedestrians here. Um, apparently this rider wasn't actually included in the competition there. Um, yeah, and just a, another example here with uh, cars that are quite far ahead here in a very small area of the image being uh, segmented out quite well. Yep. Okay, uh, what loss functions were the winners using for the, for the neural networks? Hmm. Probably an L2 between the um, mask and the ground truth mask. I, th I think that's what the mask are seen in optimizes on normally. So, yeah, so you'll, it'll probably be a cross entropy loss for actually um, classifying the instance itself, plus an L2 loss between the mask and the ground truth mask. Um, so, nobody mentioned doing anything differently, so that's most likely what it is. And that's all that I have. Um, any questions? Running all the way back. Okay. I should have asked this earlier. Do you have any idea why there were no Kaggle points available for this competition? That seems a bit like <laughs> weird and arbitrary. Yeah, there was a forum thread about that, that the Kaggle people responded to. They gave the justification that it was just a research competition and they didn't, they weren't willing to spend the time to look at the data close enough to ensure there's no leaks. Um, yeah, because there are never leaks in like competitions for points. Yeah, so it, it's a pretty weak argument. Um, so I, I don't know. Anyone else? Are there any other questions? Well, okay. So thanks, Matt, for great talk.